All right, so in Judges chapter number 11, um, last week I wanted to get into this a little bit more, but um, what we see here, if you remember just from last week, it was a shorter chapter, but um, the children of Israel, as they've done all throughout their history here, you know, they've, they've turned away from God, they've gotten back to God, turned away, gotten back, turned away, got back. And last week we saw that God was just like, you know what, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. You know what, just go, go to these false gods who you've been serving, and why don't you let them deliver you? Right, and I covered all that, that whole attitude and that aspect that, that God can have with people, even his own people, when you just kind of push things too far with God. And he's just, just like, you know what, you've made your bed, now lie in it. And we see here, now the children of Israel, you know, they went to God first, but they still need some help because they've got this enemy. They've got the children of Ammon. So now they've turned to Jephthah. And what's really interesting about Jephthah, look at verse number one. The Bible says, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. So he was a warrior. He was someone that was tough. He's a tough guy. He's a strong guy. He's, he's a guy. That's why they're turning to him. Because he is this mighty man of valor. He's someone that can go and lead a fight against these people. And they need somebody to put their confidence in, to be their strength, to, to help oppose the, this nation that is uh, trying to put them in bondage. And it says here, and he was the son of an harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. So the problem that, that Israel or the people of Gilead had with Jephthah was that he was the son of a harlot. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't born right into his family. He was born of a, you know, his, his dad was, you know, it says he was, he was Gilead began. Now, when it talks here about Gilead and Gilead's wife, Barham's sons, oftentimes what you'll see in the Bible is that, you know, because the man Gilead, the famous Gilead of the Gileadites lived way before this time. And one of the things, just, just so you don't get too confused when you read scripture, and if that pops out to you, you're like, what in the world are you talking about? Sometimes the Bible refers to progenitors and ancestors, even though his dad's name might not really have been Gilead. It's just this reference to the forefather. Just like Jesus Christ was, was going to be a son of David, right? Obviously, Jesus Christ was born way after David lived, there's a lot of people in between, but, but David is that reference point as, as being that ancestor uh, in that line. Now, it's possible that his dad's name really was Gilead, and he was a Gileadite, and that's just the name that was used. You know, names get repeated in Scripture, but what I think we're seeing here is just this reference to Gilead as a whole uh, being a part of, of Gilead in that he was, um, whoever his mom and dad were, his mom was a harlot, and his father was of Gilead. So um, verse number two says, and Gilead's wife bare him sons and his wife's sons grew up and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, thou shalt not inherit in our father's house for thou art the son of a strange woman. So his brethren uh, that were born legitimately in the family are like, you get out of here. You know, there's a whole bunch of us and you're not going to inherit. You're not going to get any of our father's inheritance because you were born of a, of a of a harlot. And, um, you know, that's, that's the way things were done. And it was very shameful. Of course, still should be very shameful to be, you know, for children to be born out of wedlock, to be bastard children that don't, don't have a father, don't have, a, you know, we're just under these circumstances. It is to be looked down upon. And, but this was the case with Jephthah. Now, one of the things that we could learn here, I think, is that God can still use people who are born into situations that are not good situations. You don't have to be born into the best place. You don't have to be born in with all the credentials with a great family. You know, it's not Jephthah's fault that his mom was a whore. He didn't do that. But that's what he was born into. But Jephthah had his faith in the Lord. And we're going to see that throughout this passage is that he is trusting in God. He's trusting in the Lord throughout this whole thing. We don't necessarily have any reason to think that he hasn't been trusting in the Lord for a long time either. It's not like it doesn't appear that Jephthah is only trusting the Lord now 
because there's these hard times, kind of like the rest of the children of Israel, right? They're all worshiping these false gods and then they're like, oh, now bad things are happening. Now I'm going to turn, now we're going to turn back to God. They're turning to Jephthah who he's already had a bunch of bad things happen in his life. He's already been cast out and kicked out and just kind of treated as a second class person and he's, he's gone, right? But he's still, when they, even when they come to him, his trust is in the Lord. And, you know, when bad things happen to you in your life, you've got a choice to make. And unfortunately, a lot of people end up getting angry at God. People will get bitter and despise God because of something that's happened in their life. Oftentimes, maybe it's the, the loss of a loved one or someone who's, you know, I've, I know of people that have lost, you know, a child and you know maybe one person wants to you know they're they're trying to stay strong in the faith you don't always understand why things happen it's a really sad thing but then the spouse or someone else is now i don't want to have anything to do with god now i want to you know just get out and and just completely turn away from the lord based on their circumstances well it's not god's fault that jephthah's mom was a whore either Jephthah could have looked at his circumstances and his situation and cursed God, but would that be the right attitude? No, of course not. We always need to be putting our trust in the Lord, regardless of your situation. And what we're going to see here, Jephthah is definitely blessed from rising up. For, and it's not him rising out. God lifts him up. God exalts Jephthah out of the situation that he was in so that he has a name and he ends up with a name that's not uh, just some son of a whore. You read the faith chapter in Hebrews 11, you're going to see Jephthah is mentioned there as one of, the, one of the men of faith. What can I say more then? Of Barak and Jephthah, and, you know, and starts mentioning people who had faith in the Lord. And they stood up and did something for God. And that's how Jephthah gets remembered, at least in the Bible and in God's eyes. So, Remember that it's, you know, where you came from doesn't have to determine where you go and what you do. Everybody should be focusing on serving the Lord. So um, Jephthah flees from his house because his brethren just basically shun him and get him out of there. Verse 3 says, Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did, ye, did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are you come unto me now when ye are in distress? And basically, he's saying to them kind of what God said unto him, right? You kicked me out. You wanted nothing to do with me. So here's another voice that they're hearing, the children of Israel are hearing, of exactly what they did to God. You hated me. You wanted nothing to do with me. You know, and now you're in trouble. Oh, and now you're going to come back to me. Now you're going to want my help. But how does Jephthah respond? Jephthah actually says, okay. Jephthah has a humble heart. He doesn't get bitter against his brethren. He doesn't let that rule his spirit in saying, nope, forget you. He says, no, I'm going to help. And in verse number eight, it, the Bible says, And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness against us if we do not so according to thy words. So basically, Jephthah is saying, so you're really going to make me the leader? You're really going to make me the boss? If I, if I go out and fight for you and come back, and, God, and, and, he, and I love what he says, and the Lord deliver them before me, 
right away giving God credit before the fight even happens. You're saying, hey, look, if God delivered these people to my hand, are you really going to make, you know, you've kicked me out. I'm that bastard son. I'm the one that, that you know, my mom was, oh, you're, you've kicked me out because of this. You didn't want me to inherit any inheritance with you. Now you're going to let me be the boss? And they said, yes, we will. And, you know, God's a witness. We will do it. Verse number 11, Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpeh. And again, verse number 11, we're seeing Jephthah communicating with the Lord. We have, Jephthah's got a very solid testimony in the short passages that we see him in in Scripture. That he's not someone that looks like he ever strayed away from the Lord, but he maintained his, uh, his integrity with God. And um, let's keep reading verse number 12. And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? So he's saying, why are you guys here even fighting with us? Like, well, what's the purpose? What is the cause of this war? Why are you aggressing against us? What have we done? Verse 13, And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt, from Arnon even unto Jabbok and unto Jordan, now therefore restore those lands again peaceably. And... <laughs> This stupid argument is still used today. Like, you took this land from me, you know, hundreds of years ago. You, you know, this was our father's land and you took it and now we want it back. So give them back now. You give that back right now. Give it back now. This happened when nobody was alive today that's doing anything. You know, all of a sudden now you're going to ask for this land or demand it back and, and, and come and fight us to take it forcibly away if you don't get it back. This, I mean, this is what's being done even in Israel today. And all over the place, people use this, this garbage. This is, and it's the same concept that's going on even today. I think politically, it's been coming up for who knows how long, probably forever. This talk about reparations for the past. I, I when I was preparing for the sermon, I just saw a brand new news article from CNN, like hours earlier, because I was looking up what are the latest reparations people are looking for. Because the big thing is it's always now, and it has been for so long, well, we need to, you know, because the United States had slavery, now we need to pay reparations to the ancestors of African Americans that were slaves in this land. And I'm sorry, but it's just such a stupid concept to think, first of all, just to say, we're going to somehow make this right. What was done to people who aren't even alive and to somehow find their progenitors and figure all this out and just say, well, here's some money or whatever, right? It would, here's just some land, sorry. It, like, who's going to do the apologizing, first of all? I mean, someone that's born of somebody that lived great, great grandpa, you know, did something bad. Now I'm going to make reparations for it. You know, I mean... This is like, why don't we just go back to the beginning? And I think men should be paid reparations from women because of Eve, you know, eating of that forbidden fruit in the garden. I mean, come on, look at what's happened since then. Look at all of the pain and suffering that's happened as a result of Eve. I think that owes a little bit more than a couple hundred years of slavery. I'm sorry. This is, I mean, this is like an entire human existence of suffering. Fork it over, ladies. Come on. It's ridiculous. It doesn't, you know, when you start going past, and we're going to see in the context here in the rest of the passage, we start reading, it's like, you've had all this time. What have you been doing? Like, we've had this land for hundreds of years. Why didn't you go if, if you needed this land? Why didn't you just take it back then when you had a problem with it? 
And he's going to go through and explain the whole history, but just this whole concept of reparations is stupid. I'm going to park on this just for a little bit because... It's one of those things that just sounds good if you don't ever think about it past just, oh yeah, someone did something wrong, so let's make it right. Right? And it just sounds like, well, it sounds like the right thing to do. Yeah, let's, I feel bad for people that have been, you know, oppressed. I feel bad for people who have been, you know, um, just denied things or whatever, right? There's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with feeling bad about things that happen, but when you try to think about, well, what are you going to do to make this right? If you really start to stop and think about it, because this is, and this is the way politics works. They want to they wanna talk about these things, but not really talk about them. They want to they wanna be able to use some slogan or some catchphrase or just something, you know, some talking point of, well, yeah, I'm all for the minorities, so we need to pay them a bunch of money. It's like, well, forget about how it's actually going to happen. Because, I mean, if you start thinking about it, how would you do it? Who gets paid? Are you going to pay people just based on their skin color? What about all the people who came after slavery? What about the people who weren't slaves? What about the people who, you know, how are you going to track all that down? What about mixed people? Are you going to give them a certain cut? Does it matter on what percentage they are? I mean, it's like Barack Obama. He's got a white mom and a black dad. And his black dad wasn't even... In this country, he's from another, from another country. Well, does he get to partake in this? What about all the, you know, African Americans that are millionaires now that somehow made their way through all the racism and they were descendants of slaves and now are they just going to get some big cut too? I mean, how does that work? What about the poor white man that didn't have any slaves whose family is still poor today, are you just going to tax them and make them pay for something that they didn't even do? How do you track all this stuff? See, it doesn't make any sense. You can't just do it. It's something that is politically powered to try to rally people who don't really want to think about things or people who are just greedy people or vain people who don't really care ultimately about what's right. Because if you care about what's right, you're going to stop and think about it and say, how can we even do this? How can you even go back and just make things right that nobody here did? You can't just make amends for this stuff. It doesn't work that way. And yeah, I'm not going to keep going on about that. It's just, it's a stupid concept. And here, turn real quick to James chapter 4 because we're going to see the real reason why this is happening. It's not because they're offended. Oh, your great, 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 great granddad, you know, took away something that belonged to me. Now I want it back. It's not because they think they rightfully own it or deserve it. They haven't had it in, in you know, whatever, however long. These the children of Ammon. James 4 describes where this comes from. James 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, From whence come wars and fightings among you. So where do wars come from? Where does the strife and the fighting and these wars actually come from? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And that's what it boils down to is people's lusts. Their greed, their desire to have things that don't belong to them, their desire to build an empire, their desire to go in. I want those resources. I want that oil. I want that land. I want those crops. I want whatever. It's not mine and I want it and I'm just going to go and take it. And he's saying, and first of all, what we should be doing is asking for it. He's saying you're fighting and warring and you're not going to get it because you're not asking for it. And then he says, when you ask and you don't get it, it's because you're not asking for the right things. So it's not just you can ask God for anything and just be like, well, God, I want to have his house and his car and I want to, you know, and God just could be like, oh, okay, here you go. 
you're asking amiss. God's not just going to give you stuff just to consume it on your own lust just because your flesh wants to, to have things. When you ask things according to the spirit, God will give it, but not when you ask things to consume it upon your own flesh and your own lust. And this is where Ammon is. They just want more land. So they just come up with any reason they can to go to war because they just want the land. That's bottom line. And that's why wars are fought in general everywhere is because people just want something that doesn't belong to them and they want to go in and take it. Instead of just relying on God and waiting for the blessings of God and just, hey, if you actually need something, go to God. But it's not that they need it. They want it. They desire it. It's a lust of their flesh. Uh, flip back to Judges chapter 11. Because now this is where Jephthah gives them a history lesson. Because they're just, again, they're playing the politics and saying, well, you took this land from us, so you need to give it back now. You guys came out of Egypt, and you know, we had our land, everything was just fine. You came out of Egypt, and you just took our land from us. Now give it back. But that's not even the way things happened. And Jephthah's going to set them straight. Here's, here's what actually happened. Look at verse number 14. And Jephthah sent messengers again unto the king of the children of Ammon, and said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness under the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. Then they went along through the wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came by the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. So he's explaining when the children of Israel came to your land and came to these lands, they asked, can we pass through your land to go over there? We want to go into the land of Canaan. Can, can we just cross through? Well, you know, we've got our own resources. Anything that we use, we'll pay you for. You know, can we just have access to, to get to where we're going? They said, nope. Nope. Twice they were told no. So what'd they do? They walked around. They said, okay, we're going to take the long way then. And they went all the way around. And now he explained they made it to Arnon. He says Arnon was the border. They didn't cross the border. They didn't enter into their land. But verse number 19, And Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. They weren't trying to mess with the children of Ammon. They asked once again now where they ended up, Please let us pass through. But Sihon trusted not Israel to pass through his coast. But Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. Israel didn't aggress. They're just trying to pass through. He didn't believe them. He thinks, no, 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 you guys are here to fight. So what does he do? He gets the army together and he fights against them. He aggresses. He goes forward to battle. Well, they've got nothing left to do but defend themselves. Verse 21, And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. So he's telling them, you know, you guys came out against the children of Israel. They beat you. They defeated you. Of course now they're going to inherit your land because you came out to fight against them, and God delivered them into, the, into their hand. God won that battle. God won that fight and gave that land to us now. And you know what? That is what happens in, in wars anyways. I mean, people lose. They lose their, their dominion or sovereignty. You know, someone else has taken over there. And that's what happened here. And of course, that's not always right. You know, the, the intentions behind doing that, people conquer other lands. But that's what, that is just a fact. That's what happens. When people get conquered, they're no longer in charge. So this is what he's explaining. That's what happened. Verse 22, 
And they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon, even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness, even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel dispossessed the Amor Amorites from before his people Israel. And shouldest thou possess it? He's saying, God gave us that land. You guys lost. And now you just want it back? Verse 24, wilt not thou possess that which Chemosh, thy God, giveth thee to possess? He's like, if your God gives you some land to possess, aren't you going to possess it? Well, God gave us this land, so we're possessing it. So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them will we possess. And I just love, you know, in, in every instance of Jephthah talking to these people, he's always referencing that the Lord is the one who wins the battles and giving the credit where the credit is due. Verse 25, And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While well, Israel dwelt in Heshbon in her towns, and in Aurora in her towns, and in all the cities that be along by the coast of Arnon three hundred years, why therefore do you not recover them within that time? He's like, you've had three hundred times, three hundred years. To get your land back. What have you been doing this whole time? What about the previous kings that lived before you? Why didn't they get it in that time? Are you better than them? What are you doing now? And, that, and this is how he's replying. Verse 27. Wherefore, I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. They're saying, we haven't done anything wrong. You're invading us. You're in the wrong. And then he says, the Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. He's like, I'm going to take it to the Lord. And I like this phrase. The Bible says, the Lord, the judge. Because the Lord is the ultimate judge. And God is already judged. God, and this is, you know, this is a side note. I already preached an entire sermon on judging and, and you know, this, this whole concept that people have backwards today. That, oh, no, you can't judge, judge not. The Bible says judge not. We're not the one, you know, I've heard people say, you, oh, you're condemning people to hell because you tell someone that they deserve to go to hell if they've sinned. No, I'm not condemning them to hell. I'm not sitting on the throne in judgment. God already made the judgment and I'm repeating it. And I'm saying what the Bible says. God is the judge. The Lord is the judge. He's the one that's already decided and determined that if you transgress his law, you deserve a punishment in the lake of fire. Right. I didn't make that law. You can say I'm judging if I tell people about that law. But I'm not the judge and I'm not claiming to be the judge. But I am going to say what the judge says. The Lord is the judge. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. He's saying, I, I trust that God knows what's right and wrong here. He's presenting on the children of Ammon. You're wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. You're sinning against us. God be the judge. Verse 28, Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearken not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpe of Gilead, and from Mizpe of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. Now, one more point I want to make about this, and we're going to see this again and again. We're going to see this, especially when we get to the story about Samson real soon in a couple weeks. I'm trying, I'm going to be very careful with my words here on how I want to say this because it's easy to say the wrong thing. But God, I just want to say, first of all, God is not some pacifist in the sense of it's always wrong to fight. Or it's always wrong to have a war. I mean, we, that should be pretty evident in Scripture. Some people that will say, like, you could never do anything, never raise a hand against anyone, never fight, never kill, never do anything, because it's always wrong. It's not true. We're going to see that a little bit more. And now, I'm not saying <laughs> that it's just, you could just, oh, so then I could just go off and kill people. No, 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 no. There's... There's a time for everything. There's a time for war and a time for peace. And especially for a nation, when people are coming in and attacking you, and, you know, you have the right to defend yourself. 
And when you're being oppressed here, especially as a nation, that's why the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And what did he do? He passed over to fight against Ammon. He passed over to, have, to, make, to wage war against Ammon when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. And what did he do? He killed a bunch of Philistines. We'll get to that later. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon people. God commanded the children of Israel to go in and possess the land of the Canaanites and to go in and to wage war and to go in and make utter destruction because he was using them to bring his judgment upon those people. So it, it's not always just wrong. Now, wars of aggression, just going out and you have no business somewhere and you just want to take over and you just want a war because you want to consume things on your lusts, that is wrong. We shouldn't just get this, this empirical mindset as you, well, the United States can do so wrong and we should be in all these foreign countries and dropping bombs on people in the desert over in Saudi Arabia or in this land or in that land or whatever and just have military bases everywhere and conquer the world. No, no, that is wicked and that is wrong. That is not what the Bible says is okay. But when, when people come in and evade, you invade your land, yeah, absolutely, you defend them. And you can take up arms and fight them and kill them. And there's nothing wrong with that, according to Scripture. That is a justified war. Verse number 30. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of the time this evening. On this, this one part of the story, this is kind of the... the big event that happens here in, in the way that I remember Jephthah is because of this vow. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands. We're going to get into the rest of that in verse 31 in a little bit, but before we even get into what he actually vows, we're going to talk a little bit and explain what the Bible teaches about vowing vows. And this is very important, very important truth. So please listen up. If you don't get anything else from tonight's sermon, get this one truth about vowing vows and how serious it really is. We live in a society today where people's words don't really matter anymore, where nobody seems to have much respect or integrity for the words that come out of their mouth. All too often, people will say things and not follow through with them, say things they don't mean, say things they're never going to do, and ultimately just become liars. And lying has just become secondhand. It doesn't seem to matter anymore. And not just that, people saying, how many times do you hear me say, I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God. And then some lie comes out of their mouth. Right. Or I swear to God, I'm going to do this, and then they don't do it which is, again, just a lie coming out of their mouth. And it doesn't even matter how well-intentioned they are. You've got to be careful when you open up your mouth and invoke some vow to the Lord. Because God, you may not even be very serious about what you're saying, but you know who takes you seriously? God does. If you're going to make a statement like you're making a vow, you're making a promise, you're saying something, God hears it. And God takes those things very seriously. Think about, think about it this way. How important is God's word in general? How, how important is God's word? The Bible says, A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. What does the Bible say about someone who changes the word of the Lord? Yeah, yeah, that's right. In Revelation 22. Right. It says God's going to take away their part out of the holy city and out of all the good, you know, basically all the good things that are written in the Bible and he's going to add unto them all the plagues. Like the plagues of the book of Revelation. Wrath upon that person. They're going to burn in hell. You tamper with God's word and you change God's word. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is the word. He is the Word made God. As much as we need Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we need the Word of God. The right. Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It's the incorruptible seed that gets sown in our heart. 
that brings our salvation. God's word is important. Everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God is important. I mean, that, that is like of utmost importance. God never says anything flippantly or, meh, make a promise. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. No, if God says it, you know for a fact it's going to happen because God said it. There is so much emphasis on God's word. And yet man treats his word like it's just not that big of a deal. You don't have much in this life. You don't have much. People might think they have a bunch of stuff and a bunch of things and expect people to respect them. I know people that have boats and planes and all kinds of things. I have zero respect for. I don't care. I could not care less about these people that think they should be respected. You know who I respect? People who say what they mean and mean what they say and can keep their word. You don't have to say a lot, and you know what? You shouldn't. We're going to see that from Scripture. But if you can keep the words that you say, you don't have to have much of anything. But that means a lot. That's a powerful testimony. When you can say, you know what? I can trust this person. I can trust that person because every time they've ever said they would do something, they've done it. Every time they've ever made a promise, they've kept it. They're trustworthy. They're faithful. They're somebody that I can rely on. That's why we can rely on the Lord. Because he never fails. That's the example. That's how we ought to be living our lives. Don't be someone who wants to make people feel good so you make a promise to them and then fail. Because however good you might have made someone feel by making some false promise, you're going to bring them down even lower by failing to come through on what you promised. The Bible gives a lot of wisdom in this subject. We're gonna, I'm going to read from a bunch of places, but um, turn, please, to Deuteronomy 23. We're going to see some Old Testament and some New Testament on this subject. I'm going to read for you from Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30, verse number 2. You're turning to Deuteronomy 23. Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath, to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So God's own law says, hey, if you make a vow, you have to keep it. You better do everything that comes out of your mouth. God takes this seriously. Amen. Deuteronomy 23, look at verse number 21. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely requite it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. And what he's saying here is that, hey, whatever you vowed unto God, you better not slack on it. You better pay everything that you vowed. Whatever it is you said you're going to do, you better do it. He said, even a free will offering. A free will offering is not something that anybody had to do. It's free will, right? And this is what the Calvinists always choke on. Free will. God had a free will offering in the Old Testament, and it wasn't because God made them give a free will offering. It's because they, out of their own heart, decided, I want to give an offering unto the Lord, so I'm going to, hey, God's blessed me, he's given me abundance, I've already tithed on everything, I've already given God everything that he deserves, I'm going to give God a free will offering. Yeah. But he's saying, because you don't have to do that, but don't say, I'm going to give God a free will offering, and then you don't do it. Don't say, I'm vowing next year when all of my cattle have calves, when all of my substance comes in, 
I'm giving my free will offering. And then you don't do it. Verse 22 sums up, he says, but if thou shalt forbear to vow, if you don't vow, it means if you withhold from making a vow, it's not a sin. If you vow and you break it, that is a sin. But if you just never vow to begin with, okay, no sin. And we're going to find, you know, this is from the Old Testament. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, where we see Jesus basically taught the same thing. This concept in Scripture of just not vowing is the, is the most wise thing to do. It's all about being careful with your words. Your words should be important. When you say something, people should believe you. If you say things and people don't believe you, how in the world, why in the world are they going to believe you about the most important things about being saved? If you're a vain person, a light person, and you're always running your mouth and telling stories and saying things that aren't true, why would anyone want to believe you about anything else? You know, honestly, this is one of the reasons why we don't tell our kids that there's a Santa Claus. This is why we don't tell our kids there's an Easter bunny. Why? Because it's a lie. Because I don't want to tell my children that there's this person that can see everything that you do don't be bad that there's this person that is going to bless you and give you good things and going to come into your house when you're sleeping and leave all these gifts for you, but only if you're good. And then wait until they get old enough and finally realize it was all a lie and get them to believe in this fantasy how is that going to work when you try to teach your kids there's a God that sees all that you do? You can't see him like Santa Claus, but believe me, he's there. Be good because he sees everything you do. Well, you told me about Santa Claus. That wasn't real. You shoot your testimony down. No, people are going to say, well, I believe in God and I was told it was Santa Claus. Okay, yeah, but how often do you want to do that? I mean, seriously. Yeah. And you mean to tell me just because you believe, hey, I believed. I was told about Santa Claus as a kid. I ended up putting my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God, you know. But what about, I, I, I could guarantee you there's someone out there that, that would have felt the same way. I mean, even as a kid, you just think like, I remember, I remember one of my friends around the, whatever age it is when kids start to kind of realize this stuff, some, one of my friends said, no, Santa Claus isn't real because we're on the playground like having this discussion, right? Whatever, this is what kids would talk about at least back when I was a kid. I don't, who knows what they're talking about these days, probably just filth. But we were talking and one, my one friend was just like, no, no, I saw my dad, you know, was putting the presents under the tree. He's like, I stayed up, I got up, and I saw him. It's not real. And I remember thinking, you know what, that didn't convince me. Why? Because my parents told me that it was real. I said, no, it was real. It's real. And I, 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 I kind of remember even to this day, like, it's a big letdown. Not that Santa Claus isn't real. But my parents fooled me for so long. I felt like a fool when I finally realized it's not real. And I know, you know, my parents weren't thinking that they want to try to hurt me or anything like that. They think it's fun. They're trying to play along. But they still made me feel like a fool. And how many other kids have the same exact thing? I mean, it, how do you want to look at your parents after that? You've been lying to me this whole time. I don't want to have that testimony with my kids. Not for anything. 
Not for something fun, not for something silly, just I want my kids to know that if dad says something, then it's real. Yeah, that's right. And it's going to happen, and dad's not going to break his promises. Now, am I perfect? Absolutely not. I wish I could stand here today and say that I've kept every single promise I've ever made to anyone in my life, but I haven't. But that is what we should be striving for and really should try to make it just unacceptable for ourselves. If I'm going to make a promise, if I'm going to make a vow to do something, then I'm going to do it because I want people to be able to, to rely on me. I want to be someone who's faithful. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 33. The Bible says, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication excuse me, be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Jesus is saying, don't make a, just don't swear. He's saying, you've heard of old time, he says, hey, you need to perform your oaths. And that's true. And that's what the Bible said. And we read that in Deuteronomy. Yeah, that's right. And we read that in Numbers. But he's saying, well, I'm just telling you, just don't swear at all. Just, just err on the side of caution. If you don't make an oath, if you don't make the vow, you're not going to break it. I'm going to read for you from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And you know what? Before I even read that, you could turn it if you like. The number one vow that's being broken in the United States and across the world today is the vow of until death do us part. Because people have taken so lightly their vows and their oaths. And in some instances, I could see why people take it lightly because they'll think, well, I wasn't really that serious when I said it. Right? Well, I didn't really mean that. You know, I kind of said that, but that's not really what I meant. And they'll try to brush it aside as if it's not a big deal. But when you have a whole ceremony and you invite everybody together and you've got a man of God officiating, you've got someone, you come before God and man and you're making a big deal out of this and you're standing face to face and you're reciting a vow to one another, it doesn't get much more serious than that. There's no, oh, I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> yes, you did. The words came out of your mouth. They were spoken for you and you repeat them yeah. to make sure you get it right. Yeah, right. It is formalized to the point of I am making this vow and I am committing myself to you. And that's why the vows go on typically with, you know, for richer or poorer in sickness and health and poverty and wealth. Uh, whatever the situation may be, I'm with you. Right. We're together all the way until one of us dies. Amen. That is a serious vow. Yeah. That should never be broken. Amen. Take it seriously. God takes it seriously. That's why the Bible is against divorce. That's why Jesus said, you know what? When someone marries a divorced woman, they're committing adultery. Because they made that vow. Because that marriage is supposed to last for one of, until one of them dies. That bond doesn't get broken. So you try to break it in man's eyes, but that doesn't change the vow. Verse number one of Ecclesiastes 5, the Bible reads, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. What great wisdom! Don't run your mouth in general. The less that you say, the less trouble you're going to get yourself in. The more you allow those lips to flap and those gums to move, there's going to be some sin. 
It's going to happen. It's bound to happen. Let your words be few. Don't, let, don't say rash things. Don't just speak foolishly. When you have emotion, when you get riled up about something, don't just start saying a whole bunch of things real fast, especially things that you don't really mean. Don't say them. It's just going to cause problems and trouble. The Bible says that the tongue is you know, such a small member. But behold, what great matter a little fire kindleth. That it's a, it's a, it's, it's, there's an evil that is done by your words, by your tongue. And, and it can cause all kinds of problems. Look at verse number three in Ecclesiastes 5. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. How do you know a fool? When you're speaking and talking and talking and talking. Lots of words. Verse number four. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. <laughs> Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Don't miss that last verse there. Don't, we're well, saying suffer not thy mouth. Don't allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Why? Because you've made a vow, now you're not going to keep it. Neither say thou before the angel, hey, it was an error. Oh, it was a mistake. What I said when I made that vow, it was just a mistake. You know, I uh, didn't mean to say it. He says, why should God be angry at thy voice? Just at the sound of your voice. Why would God be angry at the sound of your voice? Because you already aren't keeping your word. Because you've already said something, you're not keeping it. Now God doesn't even want to hear you. He says, and destroy the work of thine hands. God will punish for not keeping vows. It's a big deal. It's serious. Turn back to Judges chapter 11. Now, Jephthah makes this vow. He asks God, he says, God, you know what? He doesn't ask God. He says, God, if you're going to deliver these people into my hand, if you're, you know, I'm going to go forth, I'm going to fight this battle. If you'll deliver them for me, then I'm going to do something for you. And he makes a vow. He's opening up his mouth to the Lord and making a promise. This is what I'm going to do. Verse 31. Then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Jephthah, you could say his heart was in the right place. This whole time, Jephthah is referencing the Lord. Jephthah is willing to put his life on the line, to fight for the children of Israel, to fight against Ammon. He keeps on saying, you know, we're going to fight for the Lord. The Lord's going to win the battle for us. And God, if you deliver this for us, then I will just, I will make a sacrifice for you, God, as a thank you for delivering us from the children of Ammon. The heart is in the right place, no doubt. The heart is in the right place, so be careful what you say with your lips and the promises that you make, because even though your heart may be in the right place, you can still get into sin very easily. Don't just assume because your heart is in the right place that everything you do is going to work out and be good. Be very careful with the words that you say, especially when you're making vows because God expects you to keep your vows. And we see what happens with Jephthah and how this vow turned around on him into something he didn't expect. This is not what he was thinking of would happen when he made the vow. He's thinking that when he comes home, there's going to be some goat or some ox or some other animal that comes up as he's coming in and he's going to be like, great. That's the one I'm going to sacrifice. And that's not what happens. Turns out to be his daughter. Look at verse number 32. So Jephthah passed over on the children of Ammon to fight against them and the Lord delivered them into his hands. So God won the victory. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that God was going to deliver the children of Ammon into his hands without him making that vow. I don't think that because Jephthah made this vow of, hey, I'll do this for you, God, that God's like, okay, now I'll deliver them into your hand. No. 
God was going to use Jephthah. God was going to deliver him into his hand. Jephthah just added that when he didn't need to. And you know what? When he went home, he could have made a sacrifice unto the Lord that he wanted to make. And there would have been no sin there. Or he could have gone home and not made a sacrifice, and it still wouldn't have been a sin. He didn't have to make the vow. Verse number 33, it says, And he smote them from a rower even till thou come to Minneth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpeh unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. What a terrible sight for Jephthah to see. His daughter comes out dancing and singing and really lighthearted. Dad's home from the war. He's alive. He won. He's going to be in charge. He's the head. What a great victory. Just thrilled to see her dad come home. Imagine how his heart sank. Seeing his, his only child and remembering. <laughs> Why did I make that vow? Now, there's a lot of symbolism before we finish up the chapter here. And it's not like this perfect symbolism where the whole story fits together, right? We have a symbolism where, you know, Jephthah's kind of like God in a sense, where the children of Israel are coming to him after they've already rejected him, right? Jesus Christ, the Bible says he was rejected. He is a man of sorrows. He, you know, that, that his own people, he came on his own, and his own received him not. Jephthah was rejected similarly. But then what happens later on, people come to Jesus as a Savior. They came to Jephthah to be a Savior. We see Jephthah here ends up sacrificing his only child after saving a nation, saving all the people. He ends up, you know, I mean, it's a little bit backwards, right? But, you know, a little out of order, I should say. But again, this, this sacrifice of, of an only child to, um, for, from the, as a result of or for the salvation because he made the vow, hey, whatever comes out to meet me, I'll make that sacrifice if you deliver them in my hand. He delivered the children of Israel. He, he, you know, he saved the people. And the result of that salvation is the loss of his, of his only child. But let's finish this verse number 35. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, Thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Jephthah was a man that understood God's word and the value of when you make an oath, when you make a vow, you can't go back on it. Now, what happened with Jephthah is he got himself in a situation where there is no right answer. And sometimes you get to those places in life through your own Choices, your own doing. He ended up killing his daughter. And, I'm, and we're going to look at that real closely because there's some people that don't think he actually did it. But kill, do you think that was right to kill your daughter? No. But he made a vow. And he can't break his vow. It's not right to break your vow. So he could have broken his, his vow and not offered up his daughter as a sacrifice. And that would have been sin. And the other way, I mean, either way, you're committing sin. Your daughter's not a sacrifice. For, you know, that's, that's never something that, that God wants sacrificed unto him. He dug his own ditch in that, in that sense. He made this vow. And this is a very serious lesson to learn for a couple reasons. One, don't just make foolish vows. Don't, don't just speak when there's, especially when there's no reason to. There's no reason to make that vow. He didn't have to do that. He could have just done the exact, well, what he intended on doing without ever making the vow and would have been great and no problems and everything would have been fine, but he made the vow. 
And I'm going to prove it. Let's, let's keep reading. Let's finish up this chapter because I want to read. I want to. I want to prove that this is because I've heard. I've had. I've had this challenge to me before, saying no, he didn't actually do it. That she just remained a virgin for the rest of her life. And I'll show you why people say that and why I don't believe that to be true. Look at verse number 36. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. So what happens here is she's saying, well, you've got to do what you've got to do. Dad, you know, the Lord delivered all these people in your hand. If you made that vow, this is what happened. You have to keep your vow. This is, this is what she's saying. And this is that selflessness of her own daughter saying, she's saying, but before you do that, just give me a couple months to mourn my own virginity. Obviously, she, she wanted to get married. She wanted to have a family. She wanted to live her life, right, and be a mother. And she's sad now. Of course, I mean, it's, it's, and, and, you know, it's give me a little bit of time to kind of Go, you know, bewail my virginity. And that's what she did. So she like, took off for a couple months with her friends and bewailed her virginity. And then it says, and it came to pass at the end of two months, verse 39, that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And then it says, colon, and she knew no man. So a lot of people say, well, that just means she remained a virgin, that he kept his vow by her remaining a virgin for the rest of her life because of that colon and she knew no man. You have to really read into that to come up to that conclusion because I take the, the stand that says, when it says he did with her according to his vow, which he vowed, well, we can just look and see what he vowed in verse 31. Whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Not I will keep it celibate for the rest of its life. Not I will lock it away and make sure there's no other contact with this thing that comes to meet me. But I will offer it up for a burnt offering. That's the vow that he made. And the Bible says that he did with her according to his vow. And this isn't Jephthah saying that. This isn't his daughter saying that. This is the Holy Ghost, the narrator of the Bible, saying that he did with her according to his vow, which he vowed. Now, I think the reason why it says, and she knew no man, for a couple reasons. One, though, is when it says that she went to bewail her virginity upon the mountains, you might kind of think like, Maybe that's a little weird. Why would you go and bewail your virginity? What, what, is there something else behind that? Was she going and because she was a virgin, she wanted to, to have some relationship before she died or something? No, that's not it. And it says she knew no man. So when she came back from that, it, that she wasn't going off and, and trying to have that experience or something before she died. She was mourning and was sad for what was about to happen and bewailed her virginity and she knew no man but he did with her according to his vow and um, you know it also says you know before you do this let me go bewail my virginity well then why would what is it that he was doing before you do this well wouldn't she just be able to bewail her virginity like the entire time she lived if he didn't actually perform his vow. So I just, I mean, I think the text is very clear. In a sense, it's a terrible story because, I mean, that's not a happy ending at all. It should be, but it's not. But the, the huge lesson for us to learn, don't make vows. 
definitely don't make vows you're not going to keep and don't make open-ended vows. Don't make a vow of just, well, I'm just going to do, you know, whatever where things can change. If you're going to say something, get very concrete about it. Be very, very specific. But in general, I wouldn't make a vow anyways. I've made a couple of vows to God that I remember. One vow I've made, I'm never going to touch alcohol ever again. And I've kept that vow to this point. But that's a vow that, you know, part of me wishes I didn't even make the vow because it's so, because it's so important. I didn't have to make that vow, but I did. And now I have to keep it. Right. And obviously it's a good thing to keep it. That's not, a, it's not like some, some bad thing. I'm not, I'm not just worried that I'm going to sin, but what if I do? Man, I don't want to get to that point of, of backsliding and then adding sin upon sin because now I'm going to, you know, sin by having alcohol and then sin by breaking a vow unto the Lord. There is no reason to do that. But I made a vow unto my wife and I'm going to keep that vow because that's important. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the teaching and instruction in the Bible. Lord, help us to... Um, even if the world doesn't take their own word seriously or, or even our word seriously, Lord, help us to take our own word seriously that people can trust us, can rely on us, that they can believe us when we say things, that we're not just a, a bunch of liars and that we actually will care about doing the things that we say and, and that we wouldn't make foolish vows, Lord, but that we would be very careful with our speech and and not speak even when we don't need to, Lord, but definitely to be very careful with our vows. I thank you for allowing this great wisdom and truth to be in Scripture, Lord, and um, I pray that you will please just continue to, to guide us and, and give us instruction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.